Well, thank you so much for inviting us to speak here today. My name is Katrin Olina, and this is, I'm a designer and Sigrid is a philosopher. And we want to tell you about an experimental project that we started developing some years ago. Uh, we met in Helsinki in 2014, and we were both researchers there at the time. And we wanted, we felt this, this kind of this desire to go deeper in our work. Uh, I wanted to become, to, to learn to be more critical in my way of thinking. And Sigrid was, you were researching embodied critical thinking. So you were interested in creativity with philosophy. And so we started to have this, this dialogue and uh, decided to make a little experimental project first and foremost for ourselves, for our own work. But little by little, we started to, um, to write little texts, to post on, on Facebook, we built a website, and we thought, yes, maybe some other people might be interested in this, in this thinking too. So, um, so, yes, so, and we also built an app that we launched experimental app last year. And uh, yeah, so we want to tell you about Mini Sophie. And uh, we were thinking that, yes, that today you call this, you, you call it the, the, the Hope Forum. And to us, Mini Sophie has been, uh, at least, you know, for me, I don't know if I'm a better designer or you, are you a better thinker? But I think I, it's definitely, given us a lot of hope. It's given us strength as well to, to join forces, uh, with, to, to join philosophy and design together like this. But let's dive in, okay? Well, I'm at least a happier thinker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when, when uh, Kathleen Olina sent me this picture, uh, I immediately recognized it as a critique of contemporary educational systems. You may notice this is, uh, Rodin's thinker, and he has become a skeleton with a parrot's head, no flesh or bones, disembodied, repeating cliches without really thinking. And uh, this is something that uh, feels sadly true about many things in, 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 in uh, science industry today, and in, I think in many industries. And um, therefore, I think I'm a philosophy teacher and a uh, professor, and um, I think as teachers and educators of design, we cannot tell our students what ideas to come up with or what things to design. We can only teach them a certain way to think. And uh, like Einstein said, uh, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we uh, used when we created them because um, we are in uh, huge problems these days and a lot of the solutions to climate change are within the same financial economic system that created these problems. Like uh, the Paris Agreement is all about uh, uh, curbing uh, carbon emissions. That is of course necessary, but it's also a kind of a business model because you can buy and sell emission quotas. Also our financial system, our monetary system is totally disengaged from the earth, disconnected. So it's, it's really something that uh, continues this problem. So um, we are stuck in old ways of thinking and need to reconfigure them. And we need to become more embodied in our thinking, meaning that we think with our whole being and not only with our head. This is what we call thinking with the living. Thinking with the living, yes. It means that everything, even what you know, we call the so-called dead or alive things, these are, uh, you know, these are these things take part in living. So we affect everything, and everything affects us. So there is this deeper connection that we are interested in and this interdependence that we often forget to notice. 
uh, for instance, uh, you know, an environment makes us feel a certain way, and we also make an environment feel in a certain way. Um, this thinking with the living entails that entails connecting more deeply with things and ourselves. We are bodies, and and we are thinking bodies, not only heads, and. Um, Therefore, we are, we are connected to the earth and to the environment in our thinking. I think we also stumbled on this way of thinking, which uh, also has a scientific foundation, partly because we are thinking from a place. And I think uh, it has something to do with that nature is omnipresent as an active force in Iceland. This is a land that's geologically still in the making. It's a living process. Nature is creating itself before our eyes. We are in an ever-changing environment. The weather is constantly changing. And we think we are making the world. There's this idea of the Anthropocene, that climate and the earth are, are made by uh, the humans as, as a geological force. And that is true to a large degree. We are affecting the climate, affecting the air. But we also, uh, experience here that nature is also constantly processing us and this is what we directly experience here not the least through ruptures for instance this spring we have been experiencing earthquakes and a new volcanic eruption yes and iceland is a great place to learn about adaptation adapting to this ever-changing nature uh, to develop a thinking with the elements, uh, to develop yeah, with the elements, to think with living processes. In the past, for instance, our housing was, was this type of a living process, a construct of rocks, turf, and driftwood, because we don't have forests or, or woods in Iceland. And so the wood came to our shores from Siberia and we dried it and, and used it as a building material. But these kind of, uh, of turf buildings that you see in this picture uh, required constant mending and attending to, and otherwise you know, they would disintegrate and disappear into nature. So, um, so uh, the design in this case, this, the, the building was, was not permanent. It was a living conversation with the people uh, that built it, and with nature and the stories that nature, uh, nature here in Iceland had to tell. Sometimes, to, you know, we even still construct the roads according to folkloristic tales and beliefs. Um, scientific thinking is abstract thinking, and it has been very successful in creating the contemporary world. Science is about thinking in units. Mathematics has enabled computers and cell phones so that we can talk to you wherever you are in the world from here. But abstract thinking has come at a cost, at a disconnection with lived experience. We are now living on a dump. We know, therefore, that it's not only about creating better technologies, more refined concepts, and more precise models for predicting the future. We are, we are as bodies, part of the Earth, and we can hear and sense the earth with our bodies and through our bodies. But even though we are becoming uh, increasingly aware of how we need to connect with life in our thinking, digitalization and the development of artificial intelligence seems to be taking us further away from it. We are being conditioned in our opinions by algorithms that predict our behavior and determine what kind of information we get. But in this mini-sophical project of ours, uh, it, we, are, we are kind of find, trying to find the way back to ourselves. We, have a still, we still have a lot to discover in ourselves, we believe. And our reason is definitely not only calculative, but it's also fast, instinctive, and intuitive. Cogn contemporary cognitive science is confirming, confirms this, and we are just now beginning to take seriously what science already knows about human con cognition. 
Um, here is a picture so uh, Catherine made, and uh, you know this is mini Sophie, mini philosophy, mini Sophie, and Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. Philosophy means to love wisdom, love Sophia, and uh, we are going back to the roots of the meaning of Sophia. Sophia is um, originally a goddess of wisdom and also a goddess of earthly wisdom. Maybe you can describe what we were thinking in this picture. Yes, so we've been in in our conversation. We've been talking a lot about the goddess and 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 you know the history of 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 gods and goddesses and and uh, and I I think that you know it, this is a visualization of the past, the present, and the future, perhaps, and this idea of this this kind of like godly feminine, uh, the goddess, and um, uh, to us. You know, we were also thinking about Sophia, the robot that has been granted citizenship in, in Saudi Arabia. And we were thinking about this and, and just the, the, this history of femininity and, 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 and so on. So to us, I suppose, you know, Sophia is this earthly goddess and goddess of wisdom, earthly wisdom. But so she kind of, she connects the earth and the sky, I suppose. And to us, Sophia is, she represents all, uh, all women across history, across times, across races. She is kind of like the embodiment of this, this earthly wisdom. And here she is, uh, arriving with a gallon of water, <laughs> much needed in these times. Yes, yes. And she is sort of an antidote to the robot in Saudi Arabia yes. who got citizen rights. You know, you can control it completely and then you're giving it citizen yeah. rights. Yeah. So, uh, but also one, one me, original meaning of Sophia in ancient Greek is taste. You know, have a taste for things, mm -hmm. to have judgment, mm -hmm. to think for ourselves. Yeah, so this is a little, little screenshot of our website that we created uh, while we were doing this experimental, uh, experimental project, Mini Sophie. You can check it out, it's minisophie.com. We also have an app that you can download for free in the app store called Mini Sophie. And yeah, Facebook, we are there as well. Yeah, <laughs> yes, the app is there, there for yeah. like having a mini philosophical think pause. Yes, so the app yeah. we decided, yes. So we will show you a little bit of these exercises that we developed along the way. But uh, yeah. Well, I guess you could say that this is a thinking that not only starts with words or concepts or symbols, but you know, it really starts with basic awareness becoming aware in our thinking. So um, if body and environment is one, you know, you can think of how we are just breathing beings you know, and, and part of the earth and part of the environment. So I think that uh, illustrates that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, uh, this is based on science. Like I say, uh, there's an international uh, project, a research project at the University of Iceland that I'm uh, one of the leaders of. And it's called embodied critical thinking. And th these are cognitive scientists, brain researchers, researchers in artificial and computer intelligence. And uh, we also have a training program. It's called Training in Embodied Critical Thinking. You can also find it on the, on the internet. And we have now uh, students from all over the world that take part in this training pro project. And the course this year is about uh, Embodied thinking, environment, and design. Now, listening is basic to this type of thinking. You know, theory has often been very much about vision. You, know, you see things, you categorize things, you define them from vision. But we are thinking about starting with some kind of an inner listening. That's why the first thing I teach my students now in philosophy is uh, learn to listen not only listen attentively to others, but while you're listening to others, you also begin to listen to yourself listening. So this is really basic in becoming, uh, you know, coming to ourselves and thinking, start listening to ourselves. This is important for me as a philosophy teacher, because I'm supposed to train my students to think for themselves, to have confidence in their own thinking, to be creative in their own thinking not only to learn like parrots. So listening is really key. And uh, um, we need new ways of listening also to nature. 
these are challenging times. There will be more disasters. We need to be able to be, you know, to, to communicate more thoughtfully without judging people or categorizing them or prejudging them. We need to be able to listen to each other. And um, this type of thinking also implies accessing deeper levels of, of human cognition, sensory levels. Uh, in ancient philosophy, like in Plato's philosophy, he thought that Plato thought that smell is not important for cognition, but we think everything is important for cognition. Smell, taste, touch, uh, touch. You know, our, I think our basic approach to the world is kind of touch, being in touch with the world, connect with it, connect mm -hmm. with ourselves and the world through it. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a one minisophical picture about that, about this sensing thinking. Mm -hmm. So in this, uh, so we decided to, to, to create little texts, little exercises, and I'm going to give you a little example of the mini Sophie of the day. We have it like a twofold. There is a thinking moment and then an exercise moment. So I'm going to read this out to you. Mini Sophie about the day is about seaweed because you like its flexibility. Think a moment. Seaweed secretes slime that keeps them supple and prevents them from being damaged by the waves. They can thus hover near the shore and communicate between sea and land. Take a moment. Be slimy and in between today. Maneuver in a way that is not quite liquid, but not quite solid either. Dissolving opposites is great for human communications. I guess um, there is an aspect of mindfulness to this way of thinking. Um, because it's about pausing. It's also about silence. So it's like uh, to welcome thinking, like opening a door for a guest, and then it will emerge in you. Maybe you can say something about this picture, Kathy. Well, a door is, is, is just such a phenomenon. <laughs> it's, it's, you, you think about all kinds of doors, these veils and, and these heavy gated doors, gate doors, simple doors, heavy doors. These are very interesting things to think about. Yeah, I they think. Are. Yes. Yeah. But let me give you another, another little uh, philosophical exercise about the grandfather clock. We are drawn to the grandfather clock because we want to dwell in time. Think a moment. The grandfather clock measures time in its own calm way. It's tick tock, tick tock is like the peaceful heartbeat of a wise old man. The grandfather clock brings back memories of dwelling in some activity rather than doing something that has to fit into a set time. Like Bergson explained, living durations don't follow externally imposed time. Take a moment, pace yourself today like you were sitting under the grandfather clock, even if you're in a rush, and see if you can get some meaningful stuff done. Mini Sophie thinks you will. Here's a candle. And uh, thoughts are alive. You know, it's like lighting a candle. Mini Sophical thinking is life living through us. There is life in everything, in all things. Mini Sophie thinks with things, not only about things, but thinks with them. And all things are, have a kind of a life. Uh, is the candle dead? No, it's not. Is the morning cup of coffee dead? No, it not. it's not. It comes from waters and minerals and returns to water like the rest of us. Mini Sophie is about getting back to the things themselves, back to the ways things are actually giving, given to us in experience. 
So this is kind of a wonderful image of the things that we have been thinking with in our mini sophical texts and exercises. And uh, we think that mini sophical thinking is the blind spot of design thinking and of philosophical thinking. So it's something that has given us hope, I think. Absolutely. In our works. <laughs> I don't okay, know if we're so, better designers and philosophers, but, but I think but we're, happier. <laughs> we're more connected and we're, we're more alive in our thinking. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Yes. There we are. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Very nice to be here with you.